My name is Dan Finucan, and I'm currently a regent. I love folk music, blues music, and I love singing and playing with other people. My name is Ian Peoples. I'm a Jesuit regent. I'm kind of a football fanatic. Most of my weekends are spent watching at least a few games. Um, I'm probably one of the biggest Lino Messi fans. Hello and welcome to Modest Talk. I'm your host, Ian Peoples, and I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Dan Finucan. Hi. We're joined by our good friend, all the way from the U.S., Father Michael Wiganka, who is currently visiting Belize for a few days. And he's asking some big questions of young people here. Um, who is God calling you to be? And more specifically, uh, Father Michael is a vocation promoter for the Society of Jesus, our province. Um, and Belize is part of his region that he is inviting young men to consider a vocation to the Society of Jesus as a brother or as a priest. Um, Father Michael has had a couple of other assignments, um, mostly working with young people uh, in, in high school ministry. And so we're really excited to have you with us today. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Belize. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah. So it, it is your first time to Belize, Father first, Michael? So first time ever. First impressions. How, how's it been so far? Yeah, I would say uh, I've loved um, just flying over the country and being able to see the different, like the coast and then the mountains, uh, the kind of the rainforest areas and just seeing all the different terrain and the, the water from the air is just beautiful. Um, been really uh, feel very welcomed just by the, the hospitality of people here. Um, and yeah, I had some good food already and people just seem friendly and happy. And I guess living in a beautiful place is uh, reason enough to be happy. And so I feel like I've kind of been taking that in and um, smiling a little bit more since I've gotten here and uh, really enjoyed it. So. Well, it is, it is great to have you. Yeah, you've yeah. already been all over the country a little yeah. bit. You've been, you've been to Punta Gorda, which a lot of people in Belize City have never been to Punta Gorda. That's so you, right. you've done something that a lot of Belizeans yeah. haven't done. It's great. Really enjoyed it. You went out to, to San Antonio to visit uh, San Antonio Village? I did, yeah. yeah. And uh, saw the, the rectory and the parish there. Got to meet some of the people who look after uh, the parish in San Antonio. And yeah, really great. Uh, hope to be able to come back there. Um, saw the waterfalls outside of San Antonio and got my feet wet. Um, so I've been in the water in Belize, uh, which is something I definitely wanted to do. And uh, yeah, have really enjoyed it. So don't they say if you drink the water, you're gonna come back, you're gonna stay? They do say that. That's that's a saying. Here. Yeah, yeah, people yeah. say that I, all the time. I drink a lot of water here, so <laughs> okay. I, think I, might, I might come might come back. Well, and, and it is your this is your region. So it is. Uh, our province is is large. Right? Yeah. So if you get a sense of the southern part of the United States, from Colorado, New Mexico, all the way over to Florida, that southern half, that's all the UCS province, including Puerto Rico and Belize. And right. so it's huge. And so your region includes what? Yeah, so I have Colorado and Kansas, uh, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and then Belize. So I like to tell people that uh, I couldn't decide whether I like mountains or beaches. So I got both and, uh, <laughs> and some plains and, and kind of desert arid areas in there as well. So yeah, great. Well, we hope to have explore. you back a, a lot more as well. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hope look forward to it. Yeah. Well, what we usually uh, ask people to begin with is just kind of to tell us a little bit about your faith uh, growing up and what was it like uh, in your family, um, what role faith played for you as, yeah. as a young person. For sure. So I'm the youngest of uh, four children and uh, was a cradle Catholic. I'm a cradle Catholic, so my, my family would go to Mass on Sundays uh, religiously, if you will. Uh, and uh, <laughs> that's a pun. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, but we didn't pray a whole lot outside of like meals and things uh, outside of that. So, um, but my faith from an early age was, uh, I think, kind of challenged by um, having to, my brothers and I would get in the car after mass and we'd talk about the homily and kind of like dissect the homily and challenge each other and uh, we kind of argue over it and everything. And so just this kind of like intellectual engagement, I think, with uh, the preaching that I was hearing at Sunday mass uh, from a very young age. 
uh, kind of planted in me a curiosity uh, in kind of theology and things of God, uh, my faith. And so after I came out of kind of a, a period of kind of finding myself um, in middle school and early high school, uh, that was something that kind of called me back was this kind of intellectual interest and knowledge. And then also this desire to share it with people and, uh, and talk about it, especially with people I'm close to as a way of kind of building community around um, the truths of the faith and the practice of the faith. Um, so yeah, I would say like an intellectual component, but then also uh, a very strong kind of community uh, component that uh, my, my parents and my family, uh, we prayed before meals uh, very faithfully. And uh, that's something that I still do to this day, even if I'm by myself, I'll pray before I eat simply because it was ingrained in me from a young age. And I think that's true of kind of religious yeah. Kind of practice in general for me. And you went to Jesuit High School? I did. Yeah. You, went yep. to, you went to Strake, right? And I did. I imagine Strake had a pretty significant impact on you. It did, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I went to middle school. It was kind of difficult. I, um, I was trying to uh, pretend like I was a, a surfer kid and <laughs> pretend like I was doing th some things that... Yeah. We heard uh, you actually went surfing, though. So. Yeah, I didn't actually ever go surfing, but I wore the t-shirts <laughs> and all the rest. Um, so, but because of that, I just got kind of bullied and it felt very... Uh, like I wasn't myself because I was kind of pretending to be something. And so high school at Strict Jesuit in Houston was really important for me to kind of come back to know myself and to uh, find friends who knew me for who I really was instead of who I t pretended to be. And then ultimately to uh, get involved in going on retreats and then also putting on retreats for others and actually like giving testimony and um, leading retreats. That was a huge aspect of uh, my faith in high school. These are Kairos retreats? Mostly? Yeah, Kairos was the big one Kairos, for sure. That's the yeah. big the big. Uh, Some of our viewers one. will know what that is from SJC involvement, but yeah, what were those retreats like? I mean, how did that kind of waken up the faith? In you? Yeah, I would say uh, it just made the faith um, very, it, I mean, Kairos is all about story and storytelling. Yeah. And so I think, um, I think I had kind of an intellectual notion of who God was, but to hear people tell stories about how they uh, had come to know God and um, how God had especially been present to them in moments of fear or defeat or just tremendous struggle um, and that they actually found community with other people in the midst of those struggles. Uh, that was just something that I had not encountered uh, in, a, in as forceful a way as uh, I did on that retreat. And uh, I just really wanted to be able to share my story and be present to other people as they tell their story. Um, because it did just remarkable things for me and uh, helping me have a sense of myself and then my place among these friends that I made on retreat. And, you know, it was during high school then that you felt called to consider the, the Jesuits. What, what was it that got you interested? Was there a particular Jesuit? Was there, I don't know, was there a moment that you can point to? Yeah, for sure. So I think that that transition from kind of middle school, um, eighth grade, uh, when I was maybe 12 to freshman year when I was 13, um, I had a, a Jesuit priest, Father Mark Thibodeau, who's my freshman speech teacher. Um, you know, well, he's been on the show. Actually. Oh, is that right? He's oh, been on the show. Yes. Like, he's our first guest. I thought you were watching the show. Yeah, the whole yeah. time. I've, I've missed a few episodes, unfortunately. Um, you can always go back on YouTube yeah, yeah. or Facebook. Yeah, I, I might I might do that. Um, but he, uh, he kind of recognized that I was just really insecure and quiet and unable to like do public speaking in front of people or cameras. And, uh, and he kind of took me under his wing and, um, and kind of talked me through basically how to share my story, how to, um, yeah, just kind of have, you know, like some points that you're making and um, to not get into the power of fear. Um, and that was just a huge lesson for me at that age, especially. And I think it paid dividends in my friendships and relationships throughout high school. But then <clears throat> when I got to the end of high school and I looked at the men in my life that I really admired and wanted to imitate, by following, you know, a path similar to them, uh, I looked at my 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 dad, um, who I'm very close to, and uh, and Mark Thibodeau, and these are kind of the two ways that uh, I seriously considered um, at the end of high school. And um, anyways, long story short, yeah. Um, although my dad and I had made plans, and um, I was accepted into a business school, and and really set on following in his footsteps and going into the finance world and um, being just like him. Uh, uh, I found that like what I received in high school and the joy that I had in sharing my faith and being on retreats was something that was just uh, 
yeah, something I wanted to give my life to entirely and hold nothing back. <clears throat> and that was kind of the, the call that the Jesuits opened up to me. And, uh, and I, I, love, I love that, in fact, you brought up like this, uh, you know, <coughs> like looking up to the men in your life and, and sort of wanting to not, not act out of fear, but courage, right? And what, you know, and you just got done talking <laughs> to a group of 175 third formers at SJC High School um, about just those things, right? Yeah. And you did great, and it was a really good gathering of, of young men, uh, many of whom are probably were presented with the, the, the possibility or even the thought like, oh, Jesuit life could be for me as well, right? right? Um, and so for you to enter at 18, that took tremendous courage, right? And to, to not respond out of fear, but to really say yes to God's invitation. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a really, there's kind of a balance when someone is ready to enter a religious life between uh, like recognizing the value of his life and yet not seeing it as so heavy or so weight, so like not holding himself in such high regard as to uh, be unwilling to kind of take a chance on, on spending his life um, in this kind of dramatic and unusual way. And so you have to know that it's worth worth a great deal, uh, but you also have to realize like, um, you know, if this doesn't work out, then something else will come after it. And so kind of this like middle point between these two uh, values, I found myself kind of feeling very much that way of, I love this uh, religious practice that I've taken up very seriously. And I'm at an age where I don't have a lot of commitments and I'm actually pretty free as an 18 year old mm -hmm. to sort of set out on a, on a pathway that I don't see the end of it and I don't really understand all the different stages of it even. But uh, I recognize that it could be deeply fulfilling and deeply meaningful for me and for many other people. And so I'm gonna take a chance. I'm just gonna try it out and see how it goes. Um, and that was enough for me to make that, that kind of leap of faith, I guess, to enter the novitiate and apply and uh, be accepted, so. Yeah, and then years later you started to work at Back at Strike as yeah. a teacher, right? And and doing campus ministry and various things there. Um, and now you're a vocation promoter. You, right. So you're walking with sometimes young men, sometimes older <laughs> men, right? Mm -hmm. who, who are drawn to the Jesuit life. Um, but kind of honing in on, on young people, uh, what are the kinds of big questions that you found that young people are asking? Um, like who they desire to be, what do they want out of life, right? So what kind of these big questions are they asking? Yeah, I think authenticity is the first thing that comes to mind that uh, I think all of us are just wanting to be ourselves at our best moments. And so there's all these books on focus or uh, like deep work and all these all these like ideas around how to um, be like fully attentive to what's in front of me in order to then kind of enjoy the benefits of that sort of work or that sort of relationship. And uh, that there's an authenticity that I think we all encounter in our best moments but then we also have this like deep struggle to uh, to be attentive, to be able to focus, and um, and there's lots of different ways that manifests in our life. But I think uh, just the experience of wow, I did something and I really enjoyed it, and it was deeply fulfilling, and I was at my best. Uh, but then I also have the struggle to kind of separate myself or to diminish these other aspects of my life. And like, how do I do that? And where where do I you know who do I listen to in order to find help in that? Um, and so, like, I think learning who to trust, who to, like, share your heart with, um, how to be authentically yourself, how to focus, how to give yourself entirely to something um, and not feel as though it's a loss or um, it's a trap, but, but that it's, like, a, a way that is <clears throat> open and life-giving and fulfilling. Um, <clears throat> I think these are big questions that uh, young people especially um, that there, things are just more intense, I think, for young people and um, like stronger flavors, uh, stronger experiences, um, emotions can be very weighty and, and kind of drive actions, I think, a lot of times. And so just ha learning how to navigate all of that and be authentic and be present um, and be generous in a way that is meaningful and life-giving, I think that's kind of the, the big, so that's a lot, but that's kind of the, the basic um, view I have of it. Well, and, and uh, you know your your own story is instructive in this because you talked about you know these two men in your life who kind of seem to model authenticity. You know, your dad and then Father Mark, and you you also used the term joy at one point, looking around and seeing the joy. And, and I think that that's often a fruit of authenticity. Absolutely. That, that 
it does like result in people who seem to be joyful right. and seem to be living lives, you know, not always at their best, but right. but as you said, you know, striving for that. Yeah. And I think, I mean, young people often, <clears throat> they're looking for acceptance um, and that can come in many forms externally, right? But, but the joy I think comes when you have self-acceptance <clears throat> of just like accepting kind of where I am and, uh, and being patient with kind of the process of becoming more fully myself, being more attentive to myself. Um, that patience, that self-acceptance, I think produces joy. And um, yeah, I don't have to have it all figured out. I don't even have to be living my like big V vocation, you know? Um, but if I have, you know, if I'm growing in self-acceptance and growing in, um, in generosity um, and find like relationships around me that, that support that, then I think it's gonna produce joy for sure. And, uh, and that's kind of contagious and also affirming and allows me to continue to do those, those things even when they're difficult um, because they produce joy, you know. One of my favorite uh, quotes is from Thomas Burton uh, where he says, becoming a saint is becoming who you are. Yeah. And I think that really helped me think about my own life because when we place ourselves, when we think about these questions like, what does God want me to be, right? What is God calling me to be? Well, it's not like God is calling you to, to be something completely different from, from yourself, right? God's actually calling you to, to deepen your own sense of self, like your deepest desires, right? Because those deepest desires are actually the desires that God put in our hearts, right? And so responding to those desires is going to lead us to God being who God has created us to be, right? right? Which ultimately is you know, brothers of Jesus Christ, right? Sons of God, you know, men of integrity, all these things. So I love that sense of like, yeah, coming a deep acceptance of ourselves is part of that journey to, to being in a, a deeper relationship with God. Right, and I think something that often stands in the way of that is a, a spirit of comparison that my novice director, <laughs> and I should probably, and yours too, said, uh, compare and despair, right? Mm -hmm. The comparisons about, well, this person received this, you know, grace on the long retreat, or this person has this, you know, uh, appearance or talent, uh, this person has this opportunity, the provincial has given this person this assignment. Comparisons are just deadly in mm -hmm. the society and outside of it. Um, and it's ultimately a sort of like envy. Um, and, and what that leads to is a lack of gratitude, a lack of like accepting my own gifts and accepting that God hasn't given me, you know, the skills to be uh, a division one athlete or, you know, an outstanding um, a public speaker or whatever else it is, you know, or a full head of hair, you know, as the case may be. Uh, that God has like given me certain gifts and then taken other things and, uh, or allowed things to be taken from me. And um, it's all part of his plan. And I think if I'm making comparisons and noticing what I'm lacking, then I'm not attentive to what is present and to the gifts that God has given me and the spirit of gratitude. And that's ultimately gonna stand in the way of that self-acceptance and that, um, yeah, of, of just being present and knowing, knowing what God's calling me to here and now, you know? Mm -hmm. It reminds me that that saying, remind, like a, a, a version of, the, of it that I heard um, when I was going into long retreat, I had a former student actually, so like an 18 year old who, who wrote to me and said, Comparison is the thief of joy. Yeah. And just to go back to what you were saying, I mean, it's like, yeah. Right. Like we're aiming for joy. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. And envy is, uh, I recently heard a talk where uh, this, this speaker said that envy is the stupidest of all the vices because uh, from the very beginning, it is bitterness and disappointment. All the other vices, you know, they give you a little bit of pleasure before they take the rug out from you and you find yourself miserable. Whereas envy is never, it's never good for us. It never gives us anything we want. Um, it just robs us from the very beginning, you know, and ever since then I, I just really tried to be more attentive to envy and this spirit of comparison because it does it just causes from the very beginning, you know, causes heartache. Um, Going back, you, you talked about small V vocation, but to talk about big V vocation for yeah. a moment. So you're a vocation promoter. I am. And there might be people, you know, watching this who are like, what on earth does that mean? <laughs> uh, so what, what's your job? Like, what do you, what do you get to do as vocation promoter? Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's a fascinating question because it's something that I'm kind of learning as I go. And so this is a job, um, a mission from, the, from my provincial, from the society to, uh, promote vocations and to facilitate the discernment of a vocation among the women and men that I encounter. 
Um, and so uh, the way I understand it, as the best I understand it right now, there's kind of three components of it. One is uh, just exploring the territory and just getting out there and meeting people. Um, a lot of university and uh, kind of college age students in the United States, but, but really just anybody that is in a stage where they're able to make a big decision about uh, the course of their life um, and just to spend time with them basically and to be present to them, offer spiritual direction as best I can. Um, the second one is to visit Jesuit uh, works and apostolates and communities and support the work of um, the Jesuits who are there in uh, yeah, kind of following up with people that the Jesuits recognize could be you know, potential discerner. Um, and then the third one is just uh, to engage in supply and ministries because I'm a priest as a sacrament, the sacraments as well, uh, spiritual direction, just trying to be of service to um, the local church and whatever ways they need. Um, so uh, those are kind of the three big things. And then following up with discerners once they enter into uh, the process and, and kind of discernment uh, with us to follow up with them periodically is another big part of the job. So. So far, what's been the best part of being a location promoter? Yeah, um, I, I think the best part has been uh, just constantly discerning, you know, where is the greatest good? Where is the best use of my time? Where can I have um, like the most meaningful uh, in, in interactions with people who are at a stage of, of you know, making a, um, a decision about their life? And uh, just constantly keeping my eyes open. I think that at certain stages of my life um, as, a, as a Jesuit, I've kind of had, you know, my, my nine to five is perfectly scheduled for eight or nine months of the year. And so I don't really have to be on the lookout for, you know, what is the, the greater good here? Whereas now, I mean, I'm constantly, um, Lord, are you inviting me to, to do something new here that I've never done before that might make me really uncomfortable? Um, that might be a place where a Jesuit has never gone before, um, at least not recently. And, uh, and often the answer has been yes. And that's just really exciting to me. Um, I'm kind of like, blown away by the, the faith and the trust that our provincial has in me to be able to make these <laughs> this kind of discernment and be open to you know these new possibilities because it is it's just it's too remarkable of like I'm I mean I've been a Jesuit for 18 years but I still feel like I'm still new you know like if it's still new to me and that this is a big responsibility this is the future of our province you know in some ways that's at stake and um, it re really little old me is is able to make this discernment and be trusted with this like that's it's just a gift, and uh, and so I really enjoyed that. Um, but I've also seen some really cool places and met some fascinating people, and that's also yeah. You're a man on the move. How, yeah. how many how many months out of the year do you think you're you're hopping around? Yeah. So I mean, June and July is 100% booked, which is crazy. Yeah. But typically during the year, I'd say it's more like 60 or 70 percent of the time on the road. Uh, and so uh, I, I live in Denver uh, technically, but uh, yeah. live in Denver, but I'm on the road <laughs> yeah, and I have a room there. Um, which is a challenge, you know, that um, I felt very called to community life. And, uh, and so uh, typically in Jesuit life, that means that you're with this community year round, more or less. Um, and for me, I've kind of seen that that is, is changing. And now uh, I try to not go more than seven days without being with another Jesuit. And that's kind of how I've tried to find community while also being able to serve my mission as a vocation promoter. But there's definitely a tension there, and so far it's been a fruitful tension. But, but um, yeah, Jesuits are not made to be lone rangers, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, and I definitely don't want to be away from the Jesuit community uh, for long if I can help it. So, as you as you've gone around and talked to all these different groups, got young people, um, men and women, right? Because yeah, when you visit sure. colleges, you're you're talking to men and women often. And but what are some obstacles that you've seen young people talk about as what, what, what's standing in their way from responding to God's call? Yeah, a couple things. One would be uh, anxiety, um, which sometimes has like a clinical basis and actually people really need to, to look at seriously. And uh, I, I recommend like therapy and, and counseling um, a lot actually, because I think most of us benefit from that and, uh, and that can be really helpful. But I would say anxiety, uh, just pressure from peers or family or uh, just kind of the world of I have to have a career, I have to have a five or a 10 year plan, I have to know what I'm doing with my life. And it's all this external pressure that makes actually coming to a decision, a good decision, nearly impossible. And so I think um, the first step is just to evaluate where is this pressure coming from? Um, and is it you know authentically helpful to me or, uh, or necessary? Or is it something that I just receive and accept without really considering whether or not 
you know, that I need to have a 10 year plan. Maybe knowing, you know, the next few months is, is enough for me, you know? So I'd say like that, that anxiety is one thing to really just ask questions about and be curious about. Um, the second thing would be just a life of prayer. That um, oftentimes we know that we love God. We know that we, we should pray or that we want to pray, but actually making a habit of, you know, having a holy hour or a holy 15 minutes um, every day where I pray. Um, and, and just putting it off and till tomorrow or, or allowing other things to just distract me, that can also be a huge obstacle. And so I think starting small, but being consistent, um, that the Lord asks us just a little bit, but he does ask us to also to be consistent, I think, in it. And, um, and that way I can see the blessing because it's not just on my good days that I'm praying, it's not just on my bad days that I'm praying, but I can see how God is present to me through the whole progression of different days, basically. Mm. And, um, and that that's a rock of stability in my life in the midst of all the other things that are going on. And I can start to plot and see um, where the movements of my own heart are, are directing me um, according to God's will in those times of prayer each day, you know? I really like what you said about anxiety. I think, uh, I don't like that reality, but I think, right. I think it's true. It, it reminds me of a phrase, I remember uh, taking a class that had nothing to do with vocation or anything in college, but the professor talked about when you walk down the uh, the gro the uh, cereal aisle at the grocery store, and there's just like so many choices. Mm -hmm. and you refer to it as a tyranny of choice. Yeah, and absolutely. I think that that's very real when we, when it comes to like young people looking at what they want to do. Like the average person, at least in the U.S. anyway, has ten different careers. Like different, like not just like I'm teaching at this school that I'm teaching at this school. Like they change careers right. mm -hmm. in their entire working life. That's huge, and so. To, yeah, to, to kind of say, well, how do I invite God into that? And yeah. the fact that prayer is so important, I think is really crucial. Right. Um, but I think it can be really anxiety ridden because there are so many different options. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just, it's just important to be honest about the anxiety and just be able to share, with, speak to God um, just transparently about the anxiety. I think that's definitely the starting point. But the hope is that as I recognize this anxiety is overblown or this anxiety is not from God or this anxiety is not really anything I need to pay attention to, I can kind of set it aside, maybe make a note of it and set it aside. And then just focus on, all right, Lord, where are you giving me peace? You know, And it might be very small. It might be you, know, you're, you have a uh, grocery store shelf full of options, but this one is just something that you feel less anxiety about it uh, and you feel like, I'm just kind of at my best when I'm focused on this one goal of just, I just want to be a friend to this person, or I just want to really do well in this one class. And the other ones, maybe I'll do well, maybe I won't, but this one class, like I just feel drawn to it. I feel interested in it. Uh, I feel peace when I'm thinking about it or when I'm you know, daydreaming about you know, getting, taking another class in the same line or my relationship with this person just makes me feel like myself and puts me at ease. And I feel like I'm at peace. Uh, that's a good that's a good indication right or in my own case in high school uh, when I'm on retreat when I'm giving retreats when I'm talking about my faith I just feel like even the worst things in my life seem to have a fit in this great work that is bigger than me that gives me peace and makes me feel like myself I just fits feels right you know mm -hmm. and uh, feelings are not always you know good guides um, I heard somebody tell me recently that feelings are great companions but terrible leaders and that's true Right, but if I'm doing if I'm doing what God is calling me to, there's going to be a feeling of peace, a sense of peace, an interior. You know, it's not just a feeling that comes and goes, but actually like re resides in my heart. And even through the ups and downs, there's still this quality of peace. Uh, that's a sign that I've found something that you know is definitely worth investigating um, more and more. So, one of uh, our a mutual friend of ours, uh, Bill McCormick. Um, Deacon Bill McCormick, he's yeah. being ordained this summer, please pray for him. Uh, he talks about, he basically um, has, we were talking one day, and he's like, God's will is not a mystery. God's not trying to play peekaboo with us. Like, that it basically to, to work against this, this spirit of anxiety, to trust that God is actually speaking to us. And when we seek out his will, God's going to guide us, right? Yeah. And, it, and it doesn't have to be this mystery that we decipher. Like, right. we don't need a secret code to be able to decipher God's will for our lives. It's often pretty straightforward. Right. Um, and even if, if people, young people experience a call, right, and enter the novitiate, that the novitiate is at a time of deeper discernment, right? So when guys are, 
when I would say let's just kind of hone in on the young men is is that something that they're worried about that if if they respond to the call to enter the novitiate that that's that's it. Right? Yeah. Uh, is, do you have to work against that notion? Like, actually, this is a deeper call yeah. to discern. Yeah. So, I mean, you're definitely getting into more of kind of, I mean, for Jesuits, uh, we talk about the good spirit and the evil spirit, the discernment of spirits, um, evil spirit or Satan or the enemy of human nature is working against the Holy Spirit, the good spirit that's guiding us, that's giving us peace. And anxiety and peace are kind of these two um, works of these two spirits that are really important to pay attention to. And, and so just the first one you mentioned, uh, yeah, I think that something that makes... Um, you know, that we can be very scared of the evil spirit and the work of, of uh, anxiety in our life. But like the good spirit um, is one with Jesus Christ who has a human heart, who knows what it means to be a human being and have all these different feelings and different emotions and different, you know, uh, temptations and everything that we've experienced uh, is familiar to him. And so he's able to actually uh, um, relate to us and speak to us and, uh, and draw us to himself through these very human experiences that um, can be confusing, but also um, can be in this avenue of, of grace. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say the, um, yeah, your question, uh, yeah, say your question one more time. Well, it was, it was with regards to young men who might be discerning to, yeah, kind the of the next step. And, and, and is there anxiety about, like, oh, like, yeah. this is permanent, but reminding them actually this is a deep yeah. problem. Discerning. So I think the, yeah, so I think the evil spirit is often going to jump ahead several steps or maybe far into the future and, um, and make the, the cost present to us before we recognize uh, what the gifts of God will be in order the, you know, that God will sustain us and give us what we need. But because we don't know what's required, uh, we can't know what God is going to provide for us. And so the evil spirit is often uh, jumping ahead uh, to make us anxious about the future or making us look backwards to regret about the past. But the gift of God, the grace of God that we're receiving is always present to us and only present to us. And so I think uh, people th- have this sense of, you know, you're going to sign on the dotted line and then your life is over and you're a Jesuit forever, you know? And it's like, that's not how the application process works <laughs> at all. First of all, like there's an innumerable number of steps, you know, between um, now and uh, your life is forever a Jesuit. Um, and so I think just kind of helping people to appreciate the number of steps and the number of uh, like kind of checkpoints that people will pass through and that it's not all about their feelings or their, their own prayer. It's also, you know, this kind of negotiation basically uh, with a religious order and um, with the spiritual director and, and that people are gonna come to consensus about this with you. Um, and they're not gonna allow you to make, you know, a disastrous mistake. Right, yeah, Dan and I just got done uh, <clears throat> petitioning to go to theology, right? right? And so it's not like, it's not like you, as we go through Jesuit life, it's just, oh, on to the next step. It's right. like, it's a serious process of examining our our lives our lives of prayer our, our work and also being examined right right which can be anxiety producing if you have the yeah. spirit to because it's rigorous right yeah. but it's also it's it's done by a provincial that i'm absolutely convinced loves me and mm-hmm. the society loves me and they they know everything there is to know about me and they still encourage me and and give me responsibility and um, approve me for ordination and all the rest, you know, knowing every, everything that I've ever shared with them, which is pretty much everything. Um, uh, it's a remarkable relationship and one where there is a lot of trust required and vulnerability that I am vulnerable to them. But uh, because they love me, it's, it's trustworthy, it's worthwhile, you know. Yeah. And it's freeing also to so be known cool. so deeply and to be able to share in a transparent way it is a way in which Christ does at work in our superiors, like loving us. I mean, right. I, I've, I've experienced that. It sounds like, I mean, I think we, all three of us have. So right. yeah. it's, a, it's a humbling, beautiful thing. Yeah. And I mean, the, the Society of Jesus, more so than, than some other orders, uh, gives us just an incredible amount of freedom. You know, that there's not a set order to our day of this and this and this and this and this time of prayer to community and that time. But that it's really, I mean, our day, there are requirements, things we have to do, but it's really kind of can be moved as necessary um, and at the discernment and discretion of, of the Jesuit himself. And it's just an incredible trust that uh, even from early stages, you know, that we're given. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that has a, a, a fruit of greater freedom and um, yeah, just a, a reliability, a steadiness, you know, over time. So. 
Well, taking, you know, this is our, our penultimate question. Okay. I'd like mm -hmm. to say here. Um, and, you know, we've been kind of looking at young people and, and what their hopes are, how they are discerning their vocation, but kind of taking, you know, spanning out a little wider. When you look around the church, where do you find hope? And especially because you get to try, you get to see the church in many in many different places. Okay. Where are you finding hope for the future of the church? Because there's a lot of narratives out there, a lot of stories that are yeah. like vocations are going down, and yeah. and I mean I think those stories are often way oversimplified. Right. But where are you finding hope for the future of the church? Yeah, I mean to be honest, I look to um, some of these uh, Jesuits that I've known, especially older ones who have persevered in their vocation. And uh, when I was a novice in Grand Coteau, Louisiana, uh, there was a Jesuit there who since passed away. Uh, but um, I was absolutely convinced he was a saint. And it wasn't because I'd ever heard him preach. I don't think I ever heard him preach. It was because he carried a cane and whistled as he walked between the buildings of St. Charles and, uh, and, the, and Our Lady of the Oaks. And he would whistle. And he had this cheerfulness, this joy. And he, I don't even know if he actually used the cane to walk. He just kind of like swung it and, and whistled. <laughs> Father John Condry. Um, and many others like him that have persevered in the face of what is a difficult vocation, you know, some, some days, many days. Um, and yet he persevered with joy. Um, and, I'm, and I see this in the wider church as well of, um, you know, just lay people um, who have seen a lot of changes, a lot of turbulation in the church over the years. And yet faithfully practice, you know, whether they like their pastor or not, you know, they're still going to church. They're still being faithful because... Uh, they recognize that it's authentically uh, who they are, that it's good for them, even if the, the homily isn't great or whatever else, you know, that their fidelity is a sign of God's blessing in their life and a sign of, um, yeah, that this is forever, you know, and, and our faith is forever. Um, it's not just a passing fancy when it feels good or when we need it, but it's something that I give my entire life to. And uh, in whatever way that looks, um, I think can be, yeah, really encouraging for the younger uh, people out there who, who are still kind of trying to find their way and are still kind of tentative um, in the way that we trust um, the church or the way that we entrust our lives to God, um, that these other people have done it and, and they're actually joyful and, uh, and have been blessed by it. So, you know, maybe it's okay for me to do it too. I, I love that because I think yeah. a gift of our life as, as Jesuits, <laughs> not just when we're in a mission, but even even now we have very intergenerational communities yeah. and also with with men who we don't know usually don't know prior to living with them right often don't know and so there's this there, there's this great sharing ac across generations that uh, i think yeah i think it's easy to take for granted sometimes but just the the gift of that intergenerational like a shared life with brothers but we also span Generations, you know, we have Brother Carl Swift living in the house with us. Right, he's eighty-nine years old. Yeah, you know? and he's he, <laughs> incredible. He, yeah, incredible. And so we, we get to benefit and and really savor the graces that they've received as well. So it's right. a real gift. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm not going to talk about John Cashin, but I would say that learning from the wisdom figures <laughs> in religious life uh, is super helpful. So, mm -hmm. um, and we we do that uh, certainly in the Jesuits. I think uh, at our best moments. So. Mm -hmm. So um, this leads to our last question, okay. which all three of us will answer. Okay. But you're going to go first. Oh, okay, great. So no we, hope, we hope it applies to you. <laughs> yeah. And if, if not, then we'll cut this part out. <laughs> okay. All right. And change the question. But the question is, what is one of your favorite podcasts and why? Oh, wow. And we, we, you listen to podcasts. I do. You travel a lot. I'm on the road like, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and okay. so um, Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Okay. It is an excellent podcast. It's, I mean, he, Jimmy Akin is, is Catholic, but uh, he basically just investigates. It's kind of like Unsolved Mysteries, that 90s show with the good music uh, back in the day. Um, <laughs> but uh, he basically just uh, looks at mysteries such as um, there was this uh, Soviet radar that uh, was producing this sound that could be heard on, on other radios around the world and things like this. And people didn't know what the sound was or where it was coming from. Uh, or why it stopped. And uh, anyways, he just like goes into the history of this, uh, these kind of mysterious phenomenon. Um, there's also some really weird things that happen in the Western United States. That he looks at, uh, there's the, the magical staircase of St. Joseph in New Mexico. There's all these different ones. And um, 
I find it fascinating. And he kind of brings in an aspect of faith at the end, oftentimes. It's also really great. So I've listened to a few. Okay. So yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Super intelligent. Obviously a super intelligent, like very rationally right. minded person. And so he breaks down these mysteries, yeah, in really, really interesting ways. For sure. Ian. Not my favorite podcast, but it's a good one. Um I would say I would say an easy go-to for me is is Bishop Barron's weekly podcast, Word on Fire's weekly podcast, which doesn't always feature Bishop Barron, actually. Um, sometimes they have other guests or lectures and, and things like that, but it's always just stuff to do with the faith, and and, uh, and I feel like I always learn something from it. And, and I particularly like when Bishop Barron is on, because I just think he, he, for a lot of things that are going on in the church, I think... He tends to have a, a, a balanced perspective that that I appreciate, and it's, he's so Christocentric. So he's so focused on the person of Christ that no matter what he's talking about, whether it's whatever issue it is, it, he always brings it back to, to Jesus, which I which I appreciate. Um, so he it, it's it's grounded in the person of Christ uh, in a in a real way. Uh, so definitely a good good podcast, the Word on Fire podcast. Dan, throwing it to you. So this is a, it's not an ongoing podcast. It's just a limited, I think there's nine or 10 episodes, but it's called Finding Fred. And it's about Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers. Oh, wow. uh, the, for those who aren't familiar, I uh, had a public uh, TV show for kids for like 40 years in the US. And uh, it's, a, it's a podcast that kind of goes underneath and looks at kind of his upbringing and um, you know, he was he was a, a Protestant minister um, and had this show where he did a lot of teaching about how to process your emotions, how to how do you handle when difficult things happen. Um, he was addressing issues of racism in the late 60s, early 70s, when no one else in kids TV was, was doing that. So um, but also just this very compassionate person. Um, and uh, and then there are stories within it that just talk about like how he would visit kids in hospitals and, and just was this really kind of saintly figure. He's somebody I really look up to, even though like in a lot of ways, it's very simple stuff, you know, uh, you know, where he just says like, it's you I like and how that melts people. And um, but yeah, I just I it's a podcast that like I think I could probably just listen to on repeat because it's just. It's simple wisdom that I think we all need to hear um, that I think applies whether you're five or 85. Yeah, for sure. I remember his uh, tour of a crayon factory as, as something just blew my mind and captured my imagination as a child. <laughs> so uh, big fan of Mr. Rogers myself. Well, Father Michael Wiganka, thanks for joining us on the show. And thanks for joining us in Belize for yeah, coming to yeah, visit us. This is great. Yeah. it's. It's like 20 degrees and, and, and dry. It is very cold Snowing and dry. Mm. So the humidity has done wonders for my skin. And yeah, I'm You're dreading. glowing. You are I, glowing. I have a, a radiant yeah, yes. <laughs> skin right now. It's, beautiful. it's great. Thanks, yeah. guys. Well, thank you all for joining us for today's show. If you have any comments or questions, any suggestions about our final episodes, uh, we're recording through May. So it's coming. So if you have any suggestions for shows, let us know on YouTube or Facebook. And again, thank you for joining us on Guadalupe Media's television station on, on the radio. And, and we hope you have a, a great week. Cool.